It was uh, late 2020 when I had just finished my new passion project, which was porting my nostalgic childhood game called Marble Blast to the web. And some of you in this room may actually recognize this game because it actually came pre-installed on all Macs until 2006. So this is a game about going fast. So naturally, it developed an active speedrunning community. Um, and people want to show off their world record runs. So what I did pretty, pretty early on is I added a replay system that basically, while you play the game, it records your game state. And then at a later date, you can ask the game to replay that state for you. Uh, and that's how you can rewatch your run uh, by just pressing this button here. And this works fine, but it turns out that sometimes people really want their replays as videos. For example, to upload them to YouTube into like cute little compilation videos. Um, so what they would do is they would like full screen the game, record their screen, press that button. Uh, so the whole process was really awkward because they would have to sit through the entire screen, uh, the entire replay. They would have to like cut out the UI navigation in post and they're gonna have irregular frame rate or even frame drops. So I thought there must be some better way to do this. I wanted a way that you could go directly from this replay to a video file. So the browser should be able to just procedurally generate a video from this replay file uh, with perfect accuracy and frame timing and also faster than real time. So as fast as your GPU allows basically. So I looked uh, how I could achieve this in the web. And at the time, there was only really one way to create videos, which was using this API here, Media Recorder. Uh, but this is only really good for recording live stream sources like your webcam. So this was pretty uh, quickly disqualified. It was just too limited. Also, something people do a lot is they will use FFmpeg Wasm. But I just didn't want to add 30 megabytes to my bundle size uh, just to render slower than real time. So, uh, I also disqualified this pretty quickly. Luckily, I eventually came across this article here, which introduced me to a new API called Web Codex, which enables hardware accelerated uh, encoding and decoding right in the browser. So I thought, great, this is exactly what I need to produce my videos. But this was also my first contact with the video processing world, so naturally I was quite naive. I was so naive that this was my first attempt at creating a video. I, I would just set up an encoder, concat the chunks, uh, call that a web file, and then I was surprised that it didn't play. <laughs> at first, that, that's when I learned that uh, I have to put this in a container. But at that time, there was just no easy way to do this that integrated well with web codecs. So there was this amazing API in web codecs, uh, but its usage was limited uh, for most people because there was just no ecosystem that had been built up around it. So eventually all these realizations uh, would lead me to create uh, my new library called Media Bunny. This talk is gonna be about performant and accessible client-side media processing with Media Bunny. My name is David. Online I also go by Vanillagy and yes, I still use an anime profile picture, but as you can see, that's not actually what I look like. <laughs> so what is Media Bunny? Uh, in one sentence, it is a dependency-free TypeScript library for reading, writing, and converting media, video and audio files directly in the browser. Now, to understand the intention behind this, let's take a look at the status quo of how to do client-side media processing in the browser. So, you want to read media? You can use the video and audio elements and the connected extensions for that. And these work fine if you want to do playback, they don't work well if you need precise control uh, over uh, accessing media. If you want to create media files, there's only really a media recorder, which to those who've used it, it works okay-ish for recording like your microphone or something, but not really anything beyond that. For media processing, uh, there's a lot uh, regarding both image and audio processing, so we're good in this regard. Uh, for conversion, uh, yeah, good luck. There's basically nothing you can do here. But of course, you can add third-party code. So uh, what most people do is they will take the FFmpeg CLI or parts of libav and compile that to WebAssembly and then use that in the browser. And now you have a lot of capabilities, but your bundle size uh, is now huge. 
you don't really fully utilize your hardware at all. And at least to me, the API feels very clunky uh, to use, and it doesn't integrate way, uh, well with the rest of the web uh, APIs at all. Or if you want to do something specific, uh, there are plenty of libraries that solve one-off use cases, like we have HLSJS or MP4MoxJS, or even uh, my previous two libraries uh, here, MP4Moxer and WebMoxer. And then, of course, there's Web Codex, right, uh, which does encoding and decoding. Uh, and I think this API is awesome, uh, and it's actually designed just the way it should be designed, because it gives web developers atomic building blocks that are not really opinionated, that they can build anything on top of. Right? So it's a, it's a great API design, but uh, as you know, if you actually want to do media processing, you need to do way more. You need to do all of these things. Right? You need to demux, uh, re references as conf, uh, and mux, and read and write files. Uh, you need to do all of these things. And this uh, is what MediaBunny provides. So these are the building blocks provided by MediaBunny while also integrating nicely with the Web Codex API. And it's built from scratch in TypeScript uh, with the goal of being as lean as possible, so very small bundle size, and also just integrating with JavaScript and Web APIs very nicely. So uh, if you wanted a catchphrase, you could like humbly call it something like the FFmpeg for the web. Uh, and this is both true and false in some senses. So this is true in the sense that it gets the point across. MediaBunny tries to basically be a complete toolkit for uh, working with media files. But it's also false because it's not trying to be a universal media toolkit that can process all files. It tries to focus on the common uses that people have. All right. Uh, now I'll go over some examples of Media Bunny in action, starting with the examples from the official website that you can check out yourself. This here is Media Bunny just extracting a bunch of metadata from an MP4 file. So it uh, deduces the duration, uh, the, extracts the codec strings, resolution, uh, even metadata tags, etc. You could use it to extract thumbnails from a video. So this is an operation you probably want to do if you create a video editor for the timeline. So here you can see me select Big Bug Bunny, and then really quickly, it extracts 16 thumbnails from the video, all spread out across the whole file. You can also use it to procedurally generate videos. So here in the browser, I'm procedurally generating a video as fast as possible of some colliding balls. This also has audio. I, I just didn't record it here. Uh, and yeah, uh, this is actually analogous to that Marble Blast replay rendering example problem from earlier. You can even use it to build your own media player from scratch. So here's a Media Bunny powered media player, right? This is playing both video and audio completely in sync. And in this case here, this is even streaming uh, from a remote resource on a server using range requests. And again, this is not using any video or audio elements under the hood. This is just pure uh, Media Bunny and Web Codex put together. Now, some other people have built pretty cool stuff with it as well. So, uh, like you heard earlier, my friends at Remotion, they have built uh, remotion.dev slash convert with it, which is a super fast uh, local only uh, video converter. So here you can see I'm converting uh, a 1080p H264 MAV file into WebM with uh, VP9, and it's running at like 15 times real-time speed all in the browser. So the site is awesome. It's a great front end. If you ever need to convert a video, definitely use this one. Uh, and they're also working on re integrating Remotion into Media Bunny itself right now for their core library. And a lot of people have already built video editors with it as well. So for example, Gling, Diffusion Studio Pro, and PQMove who spoke earlier, they all use Media Bunny to read media files, and then once it's time to export, they also use Media Bunny to create that file. So these are completely offline experiences. All right, so that's an overview of what Media Bunny is. For the rest of this talk, I'll be going into some of the design decisions uh, behind its API. All right. So one primary goal was that it supports different levels of abstraction. And it does this to support different users and different use cases. To understand what I mean with this, 
let's first take a uh, look at the API of my old library called mp4 moxer. So this is how you would create a file in that old library. You would set up a moxer at the top with some configuration, and then you would just add video and audio chunks to it. So this API was really simple, it worked well, and it was also maximally flexible, because you know this is the simplest operation you can basically do. You can build anything else on top of that. But at the same time, this does not help the user at all in obtaining these chunks. So usually, you would have to set up an encoder for this first. So now the user needs to understand the Web Codex API and codec strings and all the queuing and back pressure that's related with that, which is just easy to get it wrong. And in general, I noticed a lot of issues on this repository had to do with people struggling with that interface between Web Codex and the rest of the uh, web ecosystem. So I thought MediaBunny could improve on this. So this is the equivalent example in MediaBunny instead. To create a file, you just create an output uh, with some config, and then you add your tracks to it. And each track is backed by something called a media source, which basically just provides the data for that track. And here, the source I'm using is encoded video packet source, which is just uh, what I did in the last slide. So this is just, you add the encoded chunks right to the file, very simple. But now you can go up one level of abstraction. So here now we're using video sample source, and now you can just add raw video frames unencoded to the file, and then MediaBunny will do the encoding for you under the hood. And this has a couple of advantages, but the main one is that it abstracts away some of the difficulties of web codec. So for example, for codec here, I'm just saying AVC instead of like a full uh, codec string. And for bitrate as well, I'm just specifying like a kind of subjective quality instead of putting a number in, which is a feature that this provides. And there are even uh, plenty of abstractions that are higher level than this. <coughs> Another major focus of this library is tree shakeability. So in JavaScript, when you have a library that's tree shakeable, it means it can be as large as it wants, but then your final production build only includes the parts that you actually use. Uh, and why did I think this was important? I thought it was important because I noticed most people only want to ever do one task uh, in, uh, on their website. So for example, they only want to write an MP3 file, or they only want to read metadata from a WAV file. So MediaBunny can do these things, which is cool, but it kind of sucks if you have to include all features to just use one of them. So it was built to be very tree shakeable. So if you use all features of MediaBunny, that's around 104 kilobytes after compression, which already is quite lean compared to other things. Um, but now, let's say we only want to demux files. Then it goes down to 44 kilobytes. If you only want to demux WAV files, then it's just 11 kilobytes. And if you only want to create uh, WAV files, then it's just eight uh, kilobytes. So if you only use a couple of features, the bundle size can stay very lean. But you don't get this for free. So tree shakeability is not something you get, you get for free. You must actually build your API so that it can happen. So imagine this was the API, right? We want to create an MP4 file, and we just say, okay, format is MP4. So to me, this looks uh, very clean, this looks very familiar, and it even plays uh, well with things like IDE autocomplete, but it has one major flaw, which is that this is not tree shakeable at all. Because no bundler can look at this and be like, okay, I only need to include the code for MP4, right? No, they, they can't do that static analysis on this code. So this is the API instead. Now, format just accepts any instance of an output format interface. And then you just give it some concrete implementation. So here I'm giving it MP4 output format. And now any bundler can just trivially, uh, trivially tree shake this. Uh, and it only includes the MP4 output format and none of the other formats. So this is a bit more verbose than the previous example, but I think it's worth it, especially because you can now do this. Uh, if we have MP4 specific configuration, which this library does, then we have a natural slot to put this configuration instead of having to shove it on like a top level. Next design goal was that it can do lazy reading. So that just means when you request it to extract some data for you, 
it just reads the bytes that it needs and not more. And to show this, I'll just show you how you can read files with it. This is how you read a file. You create an input, you tell it where to get the bytes from, and you tell it which formats uh, it should support. And then when you write this, this actually does nothing. So this reads exactly zero bytes from the file. It's only when you interact with this input that it starts reading bytes. So here, we're getting the video track from it. And this is an asynchronous operation because it has to read bytes. So it might need to hit the network or the file system, things like that. And at the bottom here as well, uh, we're asking Media Bunny to give us the media packet at timestamp uh, 50 seconds. And this is async because it needs to read some bytes or do some seeking, etc. And this is cool because naturally now every part of your code that might need to read more data, they're asynchronous, so they're very nicely marked with that a uh, await keyword in your code. And analogously, streamable writing was also a primary goal. So that means you can tell Media Bunny to write a file in small chunks. And then you can pipe these chunks somewhere. So you could stream them across the network or uh, stream them to, uh, the, to the disk, for example. So you could write files that are uh, arbitrarily large with constant memory usage. Last design principle I want to talk about is pipelineable design. So that means if you use Media Bunny to construct some media processing pipeline, like this one, which you can do, this is a pipeline you would use for uh, converting a file, then you should be able to connect these components so that it properly propagates back pressure. And that means like, if your writer is slow, for example, your stream uploading the file, then it slows down the rest of the pipeline, and same for the encoder. If that's slow and overloaded, it slows down the parts in front of it. So how does this look like in your user land code? So this is something you might write if you're working with Media Bunny to render a, a video. So you have a loop, you just loop over your frames. For each frame, you render that frame and then you add it uh, to the file. This works well, but this is likely going to overload the encoder, for example, because you know, it just can't keep up with this fast loop. So there's some, we need some way to slow this loop down automatically if the pipeline is overloaded, but not in other cases. And the way this is solved is really elegant. You just put in a wait keyword here, and now it intelligently waits or doesn't wait depending on the state of the pipeline. So once this starts running this loop, the wait will just instantly resolve. So it's not gonna wait at all. So it's gonna start very fast. But then after like three, four iterations, the encoder will likely have enough in its queue and then Media Bunny will be like, okay, you need to slow down. Uh, and then this await will actually wait uh, a bit. So that's it for a quick overview of what Media Bunny is and the design behind it. Most of the design decisions, they lead back to the intended environment for it, which is the client-side web. So you can run this on the server uh, for doing some tasks like transmuxing or metadata extraction, but the main territory that Media Bunny focuses on is the client-side web. Right, so that's what it specializes in, and uh, that's just because I thought that needed the most love. So, Media Bunny is fully open source under the MPL 2.0 license. Some others have helped me out with it already, but mostly it's just me working on this, and this just would not be possible at all with all these amazing sponsors you can see here. If you think you have a good use case for Media Bunny, I urge you to just try it out, uh, see what works, see what doesn't work. Any feedback uh, is welcome, and any help in developing, uh, developing it is uh, also welcome. Thank you. Thank you.